paglipas ng panahon, may mga bagay na naiiwan, tahimik at pawang walang kahulugan. Ngunit bawat bagay ay may nilalaman, may kwento, may kahulugan. Sino ang umupo dito? Nagsulat at nagsimula ng himagsikan. Ano ang mga lihim na nakatala sa kanyang liham? Ano ang kanyang naisip, naramdaman? Ang kasaysayan ay ang makahulugang pagtala ng buhay. Tulad ng karanasan, patuloy ang ating pagmulat sa tunay, sa tapat. Ngunit paano natin mababasa ang buhay na nakalipas? Ano ang kanyang kahulugan? Ito ang pangunahing tungkulin ng Pambansang Komisyong Pangkasaysayan o National Historical Commission of the Philippines. Ang kasaysayan ay unang nabubuhay sa isip ng tao at ang pagtala nito gamit ang salita ay ang bumubuo ng mga kwento ng ating bansa. Yung mga karaniwang alam na natin sa history, pag binabalikan natin dito sa research, nalalaman namin, nakakadiscover kami ng mga bagong ebidensya na nagpapatunay na yung matagal na nating alam ay mali pala kung babalikan no? yung mga especially mga primary sources. It, it makes history exciting din. May mga controversies here and there. Isang may away. <laughs> uh, nakikita mo kung paano nakipaglaban yung mga ninuno natin. No? Kung titignan mo, lahat pala ng mga nangyari, magmula pa noon si Hermano Pule, mga Basi Revolts, lahat ito, Iisa lang pala yung pinupunto nila eh, yung pagmamahal sa bayan. Sa pamamagitan ng pagsasanin at pananaliksik, ang mga natala ay hindi na mistulang salita. Ito'y nabibigyang buhay. Upang mabuo ang kwento ng ating bansa, kailangan natin ang dalawang simpleng tanong, ano at saan? Ano ang nangyari at saan ginanap? Sa pagtala ng mga makasaysayang lugar sa bansa, ang pirapirasong alaala ay nabibigyang kahalagahan at nagsisilbing kwentong kayamanan. Nagsimula lahat noong 1933. Sa panukalang bilang 451, binuo ang Philippine Historical Research and Markers Committee o PHRMC. Sinikap ng pamahalaan na matuklasan at makilala ang mga makasaysayang lugar bago ito mawala at makalimutan. Sa mga sumunod na dekada, lumawak ang katungkulan ng komite. Nagbago ang kanyang pangalan at nadagdagan ang kanyang tungkulin. Sabay nito ang pagbuo ng mga komisyon na inatasang ipagdiwang ang mga sentenaryo ng mga pabansang bayani. Pinag-isa ang mga komisyon sa komite at sa mga sumunod na taon na buo ang NHI o National Historical Institute. Mula rito, nabuo ang kasalukuyang NHCP sa pamamagitan ng Republic Act 10086 ng taong 2010. Kahoy at bato, marmol at bakal. Ang kasaysayan ay natutuklasan din sa mga labi ng panahon. Ano ang kanilang mga kwento? Ano ang kanilang mga lihim? Kasi yung historical items natin, paraho lang sila ng iba pang mga material things. So, pinubuo din sila ng elements at compounds, mga chemicals din sila na vulnerable to environment, na apektuhan ng, ng light, ng heat, ng humidity. Sa ating history, marami tayong mga pagkakataon na bumagsak ang uh, bayan, bumagsak ang ekonomiya. Marami tayong matututunan. So, sa pamagitan din ng pag-preserve ng ating items, nagsisilbi kasi silang paalala sa atin ng ating kasaysayan na uh, magiging susi sa ating pagkakalaya sa ating mga previous na mga pagkakamali. Bilang mga pamana ng panahon, ang pagsasaayos ng mga bahay, gusalit simbahan, ay pagpapatunay sa diwa ng ating kultura. Ang mga kwento ay nabubuhay muli at siyang nasisilayan. Ang kasaysayan ay kwentong tuluyang dumadaloy, sabay sa panahon, at tuluyan ring yumayaman tulad ng pagkatao.
kunin ng NHCP na ipagdiwang at ihayag ang ating mga natuklasan dahil karapatan ng bawat Pilipino na makibahagi sa yaman ng ating kasaysayan. Masasabing ang pagkatao ay masasukat ng kanyang paninindigan, malilikom sa kanyang pinanigan. Ito ba'y sa tapat, makasarili ba o makabayan? Sa buhay ng bayani, nagiging malinaw ang maari nating itugon. Na ang buhay na makahulugan ay buhay na makabuluhan. Na ang pagkatao ang tunay na kayamanan. Isang makasaysayang umaga po sa ating lahat. Good morning to all. I hope that you are all well and safe. I am Francis E. Moraleda from the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, Museo ni Jesse Robredo. Today, we commemorate the 150th birth anniversary of a Filipino propagandist, linguist, and essayist, Jose Maria Panganiban. He is one of the main writers and contributors of La Solidaridad, writing under the pen name Jomapa. In time for the 150th birth anniversary of Jomapa, we are conducting this webinar entitled Jose Maria Panganiban's La Universidad de Manila, the University of Santo Tomas, and the Liberal Campaign for Reforms in Higher Education in the years 1882 to 1991. We are currently live at the official Facebook pages of the following museums. The Museo ni Jose Rizal Dapitan, the Museo ni Nahuan at Antonio Luna, the Museo ng Kasaysayang Boholano, Museo ng Kasaysayang Pang-Ekonomiya ng Pilipinas, at Museo ni Jesse Robredo. If you have questions or comments about the topic or to our speaker, please don't hesitate to comment at our Facebook Live. Before we formally begin with our webinar today, may I call on the Shine Creator, of the Museo ni Jesse Robredo, Mr. Mark Anthony Glorioso, to introduce our speaker for today. Okay, thank you, Francis, and good morning to all of our viewers. So today, we are celebrating the 158th birth anniversary of Jose Maria Panganiban, and we are very grateful to our resource speaker for accepting our invitation to give a lecture about Jomapa. Our speaker for today's webinar is a teacher, writer, and because I know history advocate. He is his undergraduate degree in Cum Laude from the Ateneo de Naga University in 2013. In 2020, he obtained his master's degree in arts in history at Ateneo. He was also a faculty member of Ateneo Dinaga from 2014 to 2015 and 2017 to 2018. Uh, senior school and De La Salle University Senior High School 2018 to 2020. At present, he is an associate assistant professor at the Department of History, University of Philippines, Diliman. Many papers about Jose Maria Panganiban, including Avenging the Filipino Honor, the life, writings, and time of Jose Maria Panganiban, 2018, Jose Maria Panganiban's untimely death, and the White Plague in late 19th century in 2020. And finally, Jose Maria Panganiban's La Universidad de Manila and the University of Santo Tomas, 2020. So without further ado, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor for me to introduce to you our speaker, Mr. Javier Leonardo Rogeria.
Diyos maray na aga po sa Induga Boss. Good morning everyone to all our viewers. And we are actually uh, streaming live from the Museo ni Jesse Robredo here in Naga City. Uh, as introduced by our Shrine Curator, Mark, I am Jai Rojeria. I teach history at the University of the Philippines, Tiliman. And I also research on intellectual and local histories, as well as the history of Philippine education and educational institutions. For today, on the occasion of Pahaniban's 158th birth anniversary, I prepared a uh, paper, a lecture for all of us today, titled Jose Maria Panganibans La Universidad de Manila, the University of Santo Tomas, and the Liberal Campaign for Reforms in Philippine Higher Education. This is actually an extract or an excerpt of uh, the graduate thesis that I defended before uh, the Department of History of the Ateneo de Manila University last 2020. So this is a more condensed version of uh, the thesis. So this paper does not only talk about Panganiban, but it also talks about his writings in La Solidaridad, specifically the La Universidad de Manila columns, which as I show later, will uh, actually critique the state of higher education at the University of Santo Tomas. It's also very opportune that we are having this webinar today because the Faculty of Medicine and Pharmacy of UST is celebrating this year the sesquicentennial anniversary of their foundation or their 150th year. So uh, for this morning, we're going to talk about not only Panganiban, but also his writings and the state of higher education in the late 19th century both in the Philippines as well as in Spain. Between 1887 and 1889, a considerable number of students in the faculties of medicine, pharmacy, and civil law left the University of Santo Tomas to pursue their studies in Spain or elsewhere in Europe. The student exodus resonated in the peninsula prompting speculations that the university was no longer able to provide an excellent quality of education for its students, and that the orthodoxy of the Dominicans kept its antiquated ways and therefore impeded scientific and academic freedom. Writing on November 22, 1888, Guillermo Bugarde, a Spanish layman and a candidate for the Dominican novitiate, related to the university rector Gregorio Echeverria of the Order of Preachers, that an anonymous defamatory report purportedly written at the behest of the liberal minister Manuel Becerra circulated the office of the Ministry of Overseas Colonies in Madrid. According to Bugarde, the report assailed the decadence of the university for it did not implement the prescribed curriculum in Spanish universities. It gave precedence instead to the faculties of theology and canon law, privileging dogmatism while at the same time subordinating the secular faculties and suppressing the latter's academic freedom. Such a regressive state, hence, the report concluded, prompted Filipino students to leave Santo Tomas and to seek a more modern and progressive education in Spain. A few months later in Barcelona, an anonymous column titled La Universidad de Manila, Su Plan Estudios, appeared in La Solidaridad on April 15, 1889. Written serially in the first of three parts, the column was an elaborate critique of the state of higher education or enseñanza superior at the University of Santo Tomas. The column assailed the university and regarded its state as, quote, an evil that calls urgently for radical corrective measures. A continuation of the article was printed in the succeeding edition and a third installment titled La Universidad de Manila, Su Plan de Enseñanza, appeared in the May 31st issue. Writing from Paris on May 20th, 1889, Jose Rizal asked Marcelo del Pilar about the author behind the columns. He said, it is a pity that the continuation of the article in education in the Philippines was not published. Who wrote it? 
please extend to him my sincere felicitations and admirations. Four days later, Del Pilar wrote in reply that the articles were written by Jose Maria Panganiban, whose nom de plume is Chomapa, and a native of Camarines Norte and a former capista at Santo Tomas. He said that there is no one better qualified than he is to deal with the subject of education. Panganiban's La Universidad de Manila and the liberal campaign for educational reforms at UST are significant aspects of the propaganda movement that have scarcely received due attention in Philippine historiography. Although several book chapters, articles, and monographs made references of varying degrees to Panganiban's writings, there is a dearth of literature that examine comprehensively these columns and locate them within UST and the propaganda movement. While earlier biographers of Panganiban, for example, we have Manuel, Arsenio Manuel, Domingo Abelia, uh, Serrano, we have Zaide and Agoncillo, most of them were nationalist historians, identified his writings, their accounts underscored his family and educational background, as well as his sojourn in Barcelona, more than analyzed his writings. These accounts are in consensus that Panganiban was racially discriminated against during his years of study at Santo Tomas, portraying the university as an antiquated institution while at the same time lavishly extolling Panganiban. Domingo Abelia's The Journal of History article, for instance, which was first published in view of Panganiban's repatriation, portrayed the propagandist as an Indio intellectual who nevertheless transcended the racial discrimination that pervaded his time as evidenced by his scholastic achievements at Santo Tomas. For Abelia, Panganiban was a patriot whose love for country moved him to join the propaganda. Zaide, likewise, lauded Panganiban as one of the great Filipinos in Philippine history, while Agoncillo saw him as a figure deserving of his place in the nation's pantheon of heroes. These accounts, therefore, are more celebratory and at times hagiographic than they are contextual and critical of Panganiban. Studies on the propaganda movement of the Jesuit historian John Schumacher, you see Schumacher on uh, the left side of your screen, significantly advanced the conversation on Panganiban, the La Universidad de Manila columns, and the liberal campaign for higher educational reforms in the Philippines. In the seminal The Propaganda Movement, 1880 to 1895, Schumacher detailed Panganiban's involvement in La Solidaridad, both the association and the periodical, and his participation in the Masonic Lodge Revolution. He also, albeit briefly, discussed Panganiban's columns, which he described as a, quote, carefully worked out hostile critique of the university, which attacked its inadequate facilities, antiquated methods, and unprogressive system of education. Although Schumacher underscored the propagandists' anti-clerical and assimilationist campaigns, it also provided substantial information on the campaign for reforms at Santo Tomas. He documented the events which surrounded Paniban in his columns such as the founding of the Asociación Hispano-Filipina, the political activities of Filipino expatriates and their Spanish allies in Barcelona and Madrid, and the educational plans and policies of the liberal minister of overseas colonies, Manuel Vetera. These details provide the necessary context to Panganiban's political thought and writings. His detailed account, however, Schumacher's, I'm talking about Schumacher, on Panganiban's La Universidad de Manila is in his essay, Philippine Higher Education and the Origins of Nationalism, which was first published in Philippine Studies in 1975 and later appeared as a book chapter in The Making of a Nation in 1991. Schumacher lauded Panganiban's columns in the essay referring to them as the most systematic critique of higher education in the Philippines that appeared in the fortnightly organ of the propaganda. 
But at the same time, he also questioned the validity of criticism of Santo Tomas, arguing that one cannot take these articles from a newspaper whose principal aim was to counteract the influence of uh, the friars in the Philippines as impartial and objective analysis of the state of higher education in the Philippines in the 19th century. So Schumacher was highly critical of the validity or objectivity of Panganiban's columns and its critique of UST. Schumacher, therefore, inevitably went against what historian Jose Arcelia S.J. referred to as the black legend of nationalist historians on the university, arguing that the nationalist consciousness of the reformists and the propaganda movement, which was its catalyst, came into being chiefly as the fruit of Philippine institutions of higher education. This is actually a quote from Father Schumacher. He argued that such nationalist consciousness was not the result of the Filipino students' exposure in Europe, but were instead born out of their education in Manila, and that the supposed orthodoxy, which the young Filipino students complained about, nourished their consciousness of a national identity. In support of Schumacher's arguments, which I argue is the essay's limitation, Schumacher's essay's limitation, cited, he actually cited the well-documented student lives of Jose Rizal at the Ateneo Municipal from 1872 to 77, and Father Jose Burgos's years of study at Santo Tomas from 1852 to 1871, but Schumacher did not examine in further detail Panganiban's columns against his student years at Santo Tomas from 1882 to 1888. The one you see on your right is the Dominican historian, Father Fidel Villaruel. His work on the history of UST fills in the gaps in Schumacher's essay. In Jose Rizal and the University of Santo Tomas, Villaruel examined Panganiban's columns and elucidated its main points and themes of criticism. He opined that several aspects of the university, such as the lack of academic freedom, the syllogistic methods of Thomistic pedagogy, and how friar professors handle all kinds of subject came under Panganiban's scrutiny. While Villaruel acknowledged that Panganiban's columns were not entirely inaccurate, he argued that it was quite presumptuous for Panganiban to demand from UST the same degree of progress, the same prepared teaching personnel, and the same academic facilities that European universities could afford. He also posited a continuity between Sigismundo Moret's decree an averted plan to expel the Dominicans and secularize Santo Tomas in 1870 with Panganiban's La Universidad de Manila, Moraita's initiative, as well as Becerra's proposed reform policies in higher education in the late 1880s. Another salient contribution by uh, Villaruel is how he situates these columns in Panganiban's student life at the uh, uh, Santo Tomas, sorry, and in the propaganda movement in Spain. In the case of the former, he inevitably challenges the misconceptions proliferated by historians such as Abelia, Agoncillo, and Zaide, and most especially their claim that Panganiban was discriminated against at Santo Tomas. In the case of the latter, Villaruel examined Panganiban's columns against the rationalist and secular tenets of liberalism which pervaded, if not divided, Spain in the late 19th century. Through the influence of Spanish Masons, uh, Miguel Moraita and Manuel Becerra, Villaruel claimed that Panganiban changed many of his ideas and, as evidenced by the said articles, placed his alma mater, UST, in a very unfavorable light. The contrary to Schumacher, Villaruel argued that Panganiban's columns were a result of his exposure to his uh, liberal ideas in Spain rather than his years of study at Santo Tomas. However, the limit in Villaruel's work, I would argue as well, 
lies in the institutional partisanship and apologetics that suffused his writings. Medyo pro-UST yung stance ni Villaruel, as one can expect. Limits which the Dominican historian himself admitted in the introduction of his book. So in what follows, I have actually three uh, specific objectives for this webinar. The first one is to examine uh, the salient themes or points of criticism on the state of higher education in the Philippines uh, in Panganibans La Universidad de Manila. The second is I situate these columns in Panganiban's years of study at the University of Santo Tomas from 82 to 88 and illustrate that his critique actually finds empirical grounding in his years of study at the university. I also situate these columns against the, the propaganda movement and argue that these form part of a wider liberal campaign for reforms in Philippine higher education from 1888 to 1891. Now, before we proceed to the columns, let, let me uh, say some biographic notes on Panganiban. Now, he was born in Mambulao, Camarines Norte on uh, February 1, 1863. So we commemorate the 158th birth anniversary today. And he was born to uh, parents of Tagalog descent, to Vicente Panganiban of Hagonoy Bulacan, and Juana Inverga of Mauban Tayabas. In 1875, he attended the Seminario Conciliar de Nueva Cáceres under the Vincentian Fathers. So I think it's the present day uh, Holy Rosary Minor Seminary. And then in 1882, he transferred to the Culeo de Santo Tomas to finish his Segunda Enseñanza. And he obtained his Bachelier and Artes there in 1883. So the common misconception among historians, uh, previous biographers of Panganiban, is that uh, Panganiban graduated from the seminario here in Nueva Cáceres. But that's not actually true. Because uh, as I found out at the Archivo in uh, UST, there are documents there indicating that he in fact transferred, he applied to transfer at UST in 1882. And that's where he finished his Segunda Enseñanza in 1883. Now, in 1883, that same year, he enrolled at the Faculty of Medicine at the Coleo de San Jose at uh, Cali Anda in Intramuros. He attended the Ampliación, or the preparatory courses that, uh, that's leading to the licensiate of uh, medicine or in medicine as a capista, meaning to say he was a grant in aid and uh, he had to render services to the university. So meaning to say, para siyang uh, present day term scholar, is scholar. Uh, in the 1880s, the students at UST, surprisingly uh, or unsurprisingly to some, were predominantly naturales or natives. And uh, little did we know also that he published three monumental papers in medicine in 1887 which has yet to be translated into English until now. So maybe that could also be a, a good project for uh, researchers of Panganiban. Uh, unfortunately, he left the Faculty of Medicine in 1888 and he pursued his studies at the University of Barcelona. So this is a good picture of uh, the Faculty of Medicine and Pharmacy, which I mentioned is now 150 years old. As mentioned, despite the accolades, Panganiban left Santo Tomas on his fourth year in medicine proper, and then he sailed to Spain or for Spain to continue his medicine, uh, his studies in medicine, arriving in Barcelona in the spring of 1888. Through his first few months in the city, he developed a profound interest in politics and journalism, having arrived the city when the main scene of propaganda activities of Filipino students had shifted from Madrid to Barcelona. In October 1888, several members of the Madrid colony, most notably Antonio Luna, went to Barcelona to see the Universal Exposition, which was then taking place at the Parque de la Ciutadela. They were to confer with Mariano Ponce, as well on the question of editorship 
of a new Filipino newspaper they were planning to establish. In the same month, Moraita and Labra were also in the city. And so the Barcelona colony led by Ponce and Graciano Lopez Jaina organized a banquet in honor of the two Masons. The speeches delivered there extolled cooperation between peninsulars and Filipinos and all sons of a common mother Spain and reiterated the need to extend to the Philippines the rights and liberties that belong to all Spaniards. Lopez Jaina's speech, which was the banquet's principal speech, underscored the expulsion of the friars in the Philippines, pledging support to Moraita's Asociación Hispano-Filipina. Ponce, on the other hand, maintained a more moderate stance in his demand for reforms, declaring that in the Philippines, there were no filibusteros, only sons of Spain seeking reforms. To say nothing of how Barcelona was the locus of political movements in the late 19th century, Panganiban was in the middle of these occasions, which initiated him consequently into the propaganda movement. Now let's go to the La Universidad de Manila. Now these columns appeared in the April 15, 30, and May 15, 1889 issues of La Solidaridad. And by June 1889, Panganiban had stopped writing for uh, the periodical because he had grown frail and sickly. He will not uh, appear again until uh, the following year in 1890. Now, in the next few slides, I will be talking to you about the uh, salient points of criticism that Panganiban argued in La Universidad de Manila. So these are aspects of the university which he criticized. Now, we remember that Schumacher mentioned that it was only the uh, religious orthodoxy of the Dominicans which uh, prompted students to leave the university and move to Spain. But uh, as Villaruel argued, I will show in, a, in the next few slides that there are other aspects of the university that Panganiban also censured. And uh, we will discuss that in just a bit. So the first aspect Panganiban censured was the uh, religious orthodoxy of the Dominicans. He observed that the academic freedom of both the professor and of the students in the university was subject to either the friar's approval or censorship. He cites, for example, the case of an unnamed student who was charged with the sale of books without permission, an offense that's not yet in the school codes when the case was filed. The student was possessing Rizal's Nolimitangre. Panganiban opined that uh, any scientific idea forwarded in the university whether they be moral, social, or political, are carefully sifted through the lenses of Thomistic doctrines, and that all the avenues of knowledge, all the ways to progress, all means of cultural attainment, are subject to the friar's vigilant eye. Any book, therefore, or liberal idea critical to the philosophies of St. Thomas Aquinas whose feast, uh, feast day we just uh, celebrated a few days ago, or to any of the eternal truths preached by the Catholic Church or to the scholastic tradition, which the Dominican fathers so espoused were censored. We remember on August 30, uh, 1887, Panganiban was in his fourth year of study uh, at the Faculty of Medicine. It was during that time, when a special committee composed of uh, Dominican professors, uh, fathers Evaristo Arias, Norberto del Prado, and Matias Gomez, we remember this panel as the panel that censored the Noli Mitangere and declared the novel as, quote, heretic. They were appointed by Father Echeverria, the rector, and the committee found that the novel was, quote, heretical, impious, and scandalous in the religious aspect, and anti-patriotic, subversive of the public order, injurious to the Spanish government and its policies in the political aspect. They argued that the whole narrative of Rizal Snoli goes against the Catholic dogma, against the Catholic Church, the religious order, against civil, military, social, and political institutions. 
Now, with the power of censorship that was at the disposal of the Dominican Fathers at Santo Tomas, Panganiban faciously compared them to the immovable Sphinx. If you're familiar with the Sphinx and uh, the, the mythology of the Sphinx, uh, menacingly surveilling at the tip of Mariveles. It was actually an ingenious allusion to the mythical creature in uh, Sophocles' tragedy, Oedipus Rex, and the reference to Mariveles, which is a town at the tip of the Bataan Peninsula overlooking Manila Bay. Just as the Sphinx guarded the city of Thebes from any traveler who wished to enter by asking a riddle, the Dominicans, especially after copies of the Noli were distributed in the colony, maintained a vigilant eye and scrutinized any liberal idea, threatening to permeate not only at the university, but also in Manila. Like the Sphinx that devours the travelers who are unable to answer the riddle, the Dominicans for Panganiban censored texts that did not conform to their Thomistic standards and therefore penalized anyone who possessed them. Students found this atmosphere rather asphyxiating or in Tagalog nakakasakal or nakakasuffocate yung ganitong atmosphere daw, sabi ni Panganiban. Now the second uh, facet of the university that came under Panganiban's scrutiny was the method of filling professorial chairs. So he argued that uh, UST practiced nominations without competitive examinations. And in that regard, the university rector simply recommends a candidate to the governor general, and then the governor general in turn, without scrutinizing the recommendation, immediately approves the recommendation of the said rector. An example cited uh, in this paper, I will not read the whole thing, was the case of Salvador Naranjo in 1882. Now, Naranjo was actually Panganiban's uh, professor when he was in third year of uh, medical studies at UST. Now, Joaquin Jovellar approved the proposal of Echeverria and that Naranjo was immediately appointed to teach pathology without the virtue of competitive examinations. Now, why was it wrong? Why, was, uh, why did Panganiban find this method problematic? Now, he argues that the problem in nomination lies in how the practice lends itself to favoritism. These posts were not necessarily uh, handed or given to the most qualified and competent candidates, but to those who are most favored by the Dominicans. And therefore, Panganiban proposes that to ensure uh, an objective and a rigorous process, he proposed a competitive examination. Um, the context behind this is that maybe he saw in Barcelona that professorial chairs there were not easily handed. As a matter of fact, they're uh, even publicly announced. If, uh, if there's uh, an opening, if there's a competitive exam, who are these applicants? Who will be the panel? These things are publicly or were publicly announced in Spain. Whereas in UST, in the Philippines, uh, the recommendation did not undergo uh, that kind of a transparent procedure. And therefore, Panganiban was highly critical of that. And therefore, he argued that these exams will ensure a fair, objective, and a rigorous selection process in filling vacant posts. Now let's go to the third facet, which is the professorial chairs at UST. Napanganiban used the term, quote, method of economy in filling professorial chairs. Sabi niya, uh, yung kakulangan daw sa professor ay isang malaking problema sa UST. The lack of professors for the essential courses uh, is highly problematic at UST. So that uh, there was only one professor teaching uh, four or even three courses at once. Uh, and those courses are actually were actually compressed into just one hour sessions a day. So an example that he cited was from the Faculty of Civil Law. Uh, he says, thus the professor of mercantil law is also the professor of criminal law. That of political law handles admin law, colonial law, political economics, and statistics. So he was actually referring to these two gentlemen, uh, Francisco de Saez Centenat 
and Eugenio del Saz Orozco. This is from the uh, Libros de Matriculas de Facultad from AUST. In the case of uh, the Faculty of Medicine, uh, there was only one professor who taught general anatomy, histology, and laboratory work for anatomy, and that was Don Rafael Ginard, who was Panganiban's uh, professor when he was in first year. He also cited that uh, there was only one professor in the following courses in physiology, hygiene, sanitation, taught by Carlos Nalda, general and clinical pathology and pathologic histology taught by Naranjo. You have obstetrics, gynecology, and pediatrics by Felix Bueno Chicoy. And finally, legal medicine, toxicology, and dermatology taught by uh, Jose de Irastorza. So we see in these few examples that uh, there was too much workload for these professors and uh, the subjects that they taught were only taught for only one hour a day. So they had to compress everything into just one hour's worth of session. Another facet about the professors that Panganiban censured, I think this is one of the most important, was how he censured prior professors in the university and called them walking encyclopedias for their, quote, omniscience. Some examples that uh, I could cite were uh, Father or are Father Raimundo Velasquez OP and Father Evaristo Fernandez Arias. Father Genaro Buitra Buitrago of uh, the Order of Preachers was Panganiban's professor in physics and in French, not to mention Buitrago also taught theology at the same time. So this is where Panganiban was coming from when he criticized the friar professors as omniscient or walking encyclopedias. Now, the fourth facet of the university was the pedagogical paradigm or the school of thought that UST was uh, subscribing to in their instruction and uh, practice of examinations. So according to Panganiban, unfortunately, in the field of medicine, Practice was the phase that was least attended to. And Panganiban cited in his columns the example of Salvador Naranjo's general and clinical pathology class and Castro Lopez Preya's surgery class. So this is actually a quote from, uh, I believe this is the second installment of La Universidad de Manila, where Panganiban says, and I quote, the way that the subject was taught by the professor is very odd. On the day when a major operation is to be made, the students of the third year must be present to watch the operation. But the spectators only of the ability or the lack of ability of the surgeon. Nothing is said to them of whatever method is used or of what procedure is being followed, nor of the data that they should know when they attend the operation. It is just like watching a machine manipulated and put to work, showing absolutely nothing of its mechanism. So this is uh, Panganiban criticizing the pedagogy or how uh, their courses were taught at USD. Furthermore, uh, he observed that the Dominicans privileged syllogism as exercised in instruction and examinations in the Faculty of Medicine. He censured the scholastic method of instruction, the lectio and the disputatio, and argued that this paradigm was highly inappropriate in teaching medical science. If you can uh, actually go back to El Filibusterismo, uh, Rizal also took a swipe at this, uh, at this method of teaching. If I'm not mistaken, that's the chapter on uh, the class in physics. You know? I forgot the chapter number, but that's the chapter in the class in physics or uh, class in physica. He argued, Panganiban argued, that uh, the scholastico Aristotelian method was highly unscientific. So, yung UST kasi nung panahon na yon, they were uh, using this paradigm by, uh, of course, by Aquinas and also Aristotle. It was, it was highly scholastic. And Panganiban believed that uh, for medical sciences to be more effective, or at least the teaching of medical sciences to be more effective, it has to be more empirical rather than speculative. It has to be more experimental 
rather than simply uh, deducing conclusions from premises which are actually uh, ill-founded or um, actually that are not or that have the benefit, uh, sorry, the, the burden of proof. And the last aspect of uh, the university, which Panganiban uh, criticized in La Universidad de Manila, was the lack of facilities. At least ngayon may hospital na ang UST, you know? pero kailan lang naman yung hospital nila. Uh, I believe Professor Torres of DLSU, he posted that on Facebook a few days ago. And I think he said there it was only in the 1940s when UST uh, built their, their university hospital. So that's, that's decades after Panganiban. So Panganiban uh, censured the absence of a hospital or laboratory for clinical practice. And again, he cited the surgical anatomy class under Castro Lopez Brea, uh, which was held at the uh, San Juan de Dios Hospital. So this is uh, San Juan de Dios Hospital. This is the hospital where uh, students uh, go to, and uh, that's where they hold their lectures and uh, their classes, in, in some of the subjects at least. Panganiban said that uh, student pass without medical courses uh, sorry, they, they pass medical courses without fully learning the needed skills and competencies. And therefore, this incompetence results into medical malpractice. So for Panganiban, uh, Santo Tomas needed to have a hospital. So fortunately, now meron ang hospital um, USD where their students can practice. Okay, now in the context of the propaganda movement, it is important here to note that uh, Panganiban's La Universidad de Manila did not, in, uh, did, not, did not exist in a vacuum. On the contrary, it was actually part of a wider campaign for reforms in higher education, which, as I argued in this paper, did not begin and end with Panganiban and his La Universidad de Manila columns in La Solidaridad. His writings, I argue, form part of a wider campaign for reforms in Spain, and that it owes its genesis or its beginning to the political scene in Madrid, particularly Moraita and Labra, in organizing the Asociación Hispano-Filipina. Now, speaking of the Asociación, it actually, uh, they actually included the secularization of Santo Tomas as one of its political agenda in its inception on July 1888. They lobbied uh, their agenda to secularize Santo Tomas to the Ministry of Overseas Colonies led by Manuel Becerra. And on behalf of La Solidaridad and the Barcelona colony, Lopez Jaina and the rest of the editorial staff, they pledged their support for Moraita and his association. On the other hand, what we have to know here is that Panganiban by that time was already very sick and that due to his worsening health condition, he had to abandon his medical studies at uh, Barcelona. And this is something that not too many historians are fond of telling or uh, mentioning in their narrative. But Panganiban was actually involved in a scandal in Barcelona. Um, if you go back to the letters of Jose Rizal and Mariano Ponce, you will find there that they were actually talking about how Panganiban was uh, beaten up uh, badly by two gentlemen in Barcelona because apparently Panganiban had been having an affair with the wife of that Spaniard. So he was beaten up badly, publicly in Barcelona. And this took place sometime around June or July of 1890. I'm not so sure of the date. But the letters of Ponce and Rizal were dated sometime in July, June and July of 1890. So it must have happened sometime around June or even before that. On September 30th, 1890, La Solidaridad released a special issue, the one you see on your left, dedicated to Panganiban. So some historians would see this as an obituary, as a tribute to their fellow countrymen. But... Other historians, uh, especially cynical ones, skeptical, skeptical ones, would see this as the propagandists appropriating the death 
of Panganiban to forward their cause. And I'm one of those uh, who actually argue that that was the case, why Panganiban was uh, given this special issue. Number one, I'd like to think that they were trying to regain the credibility, the integrity of the movement. Because right? if, if you're involved in the scandal or in a scandal, that will definitely tarnish the reputation of not only Panganiban, but also the Filipinos in Spain or in Barcelona at least. Uh, for another, what we have to remember here is that the propagandists were uh, campaigning for assimilation, that the Philippines be a full-fledged province of Spain. And in order for them to do that, they were trying to uh, assert or show the Spaniards that we are as civilized as they were, or we are uh, as, as uh, worthy of assimilation um, as the other provinces of Spain. So, ginamit nila yung kamatayan ni Panganiban bilang uh, propaganda no? in, in forwarding that, uh, that cause to, to Spain during that time. So again, it's very simplistic to say that this is just a tribute to Panganiban. I'd like to think this is an appropriation of Panganiban to the propaganda and their cause or causes. Okay, now let's go to Manuel Becerra. Now, he was a former deputy of the Junta Superior Revolucionaria, and he was appointed Minister of Overseas Colonies by Paxedes Sagasta on December 11, 1888. His term as minister was seen as a constant threat to the Catholic Church in the Philippines. This is our, actually an argument from John Schumacher. His projects included the separation of the faculties of medicine and pharmacy from USC, and a general reduction of the ecclesiastical budget in favor of public education. So you see now why he was seen as a constant threat to the Catholic Church in the Philippines. Now, according to Schumacher, the direction of Becerra's policy was mainly to weaken the possession of the religious orders in the Philippines and to secularize education. Now, it's important to note at this point that this was not the first time when liberal Spaniards were trying to secularize education. As I mentioned earlier, in 1870, Sismundo Moret decreed that UST be uh, secularized and uh, that the Dominicans be expelled from the university. No? And therefore, yung administration ng, ng UST ay napunta na sa kamay ng civil government. As a matter of fact, UST in 1870 was renamed into Universidad de Filipinas, so University of the Philippines, dahil naging secular sila. But this secularized university was short-lived because by 1875, uh, by, by the restoration, you will see, uh, we, will, we will find out that uh, the Dominicans were back and they reorganized UST. Actually, I tell my uh, doctor friends who studied at UST that um, there are two histories surrounding the Faculty of Medicine. The first one is, uh, well, the Dominicans, they will not uh, recognize the 1870 as the date of foundation or 1871 as the date of foundation for the Faculty of Medicine. Whereas some groups like the alumni, uh, they would look at 1871 as the year of foundation for uh, the USD and the Faculty of Medicine and Pharmacy. Now, going back to Becerra, he lobbied to the parliament a series of reforms for the Philippines, including A, a compulsory teaching of Spanish, B, the establishment of secondary schools and schools of arts and trades in Manila and Visayas, C, the fiscal plan favoring public education, and most importantly for our discussion today, uh, the way he petitioned to the Dominicans the part of the state in higher education in the Philippines. Now, we must remember here that uh, UST is a royal university. Before it became a pontifical university, it was a royal university. So Becerra and the other liberals were petitioning for their part uh, in terms of administering UST. You know? And Panganiban was one of those uh, Filipino students 
who uh, was actually supporting that cause. Unfortunately for Becerra, his reform or proposed reform was met with indignation. And due to these objections, Sagasta, uh, Praxedes Sagasta, who was the prime minister back then, he deferred the approval of Becerra's proposed reforms and recommended it to the Council of State, where unfortunately it did not go any further. And in 19, uh, 1890, these proposed reforms remained in mere debates and La Solidaridad had gone silent in their campaign for educational reforms. By August, Panganiban uh, was already dead by uh, August of 1890. To exacerbate things further, on July 3, 1890, uh, Sagasta's liberal government fell. So this is the liberal government, you know. And then the conservatives returned to power with Antonio Canovas del Castillo as the prime minister. And likewise, Becerra was gone and replaced by Antonio Fabi and uh, Francisco Romero Robledo. Both of them were conservatives. And as a result, Becerra's reform policies in education have been repealed. Now, on September 6, 1890, Moraita wrote Del Pilar. With the fall of Becerra and Sagasta, it was futile to continue lobbying reforms to the government. The conservatives were expected to empower the religious orders in the Philippines. This is why uh, Moraita wrote that to Del Pilar. And that uh, Moraita also proposed a shift in terms of the campaign's approach uh, that uh, it's better for them to look to turn to the public and rally for their support rather than petition the conservative government for these reforms. Now, the La Universidad de Manila continued even after Panganiban's death. 18 months after uh, Panganiban published his last La Universidad de Manila column, Del Pilar resumed its publication in the periodical on December 15, 1890. It actually examined in greater detail the faculties of civil law, pharmacy, and medicine at UST, and contrasted with the curricula enforced at uh, the Universidad de Madrid, among other universities in Spain. Now it argued that if UST were royal in character, it ought to align with the curricula of state universities in Spain. And uh, this, this new series, I argue as well in the paper, it continued Panganiban, or they continued Panganiban's campaign for competitive examinations as method of filling professorial chairs. The new series constituted La Universidad's campaign for the secularization of Santo Tomas after the fall of the Liberal Party and Panganiban's death in 1890. So you will see here a uh, table containing the, uh, the articles of, uh, written by different staff members of La Solidaridad. So they wrote, if I'm not mistaken, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten more uh, articles after Panganiban had died. So they continued the campaign that Panganiban started. Becerra, on the other hand, reopened parliamentary discussions on Philippine education. He filed a comprehensive bill uh, reorganizing public education in the Philippines. And he covered not only higher education, but also primary and secondary. And uh, his proposed bill was very lengthy. It had 47 articles and was premised on how the Spanish state or government has little to no intervention in Philippine public education, aside from the fact that it's the state that subsidizes these educational institutions. This time around, Becerra was more compromising and held a more moderate stance towards the Dominicans. He saw the secularization of Santo Tomas and the expulsion of the Dominicans as a remote possibility, as it would be difficult for these proposals to proceed in the parliament, even so to gain popular support. Uh, if you have uh, the copy of the, the, the bill, it's actually in La Solidaridad. Uh, you will see there that articles 37 to 43 were the ones that were pertinent to higher education in the Philippines. 
So some salient provisions, I think this will be my last uh, point for the morning before I uh, read my conclusion. Uh, vacancies in the professorial chairs shall be filled by the minister of the overseas colonies and after a competitive examination shall have been held in Manila and in Madrid. Uh, exemptions to this uh, article were the faculty of canon law and theology and the canonical law courses in the faculty of civil law. So we see here a more compromising Becerra, as I mentioned earlier. He was trying to balance the interests of the Filipino students, uh, the liberal Spaniards, as well as the Dominican fathers in Santo Tomas. Now, he also proposed that the Ministro de Ultramar be given the power to order all the rules on the organization of the curricula and of faculty in the different branches and levels of education. Unfortunately, the conservatives who were the ruling uh, politicians or ruling party, political party during that time, they opposed the bill. And it remained in parliamentary discussions and did not pass into law. Now, in the foregoing slides, I examined the La Universidad de Manila and elaborated on five main points of criticism Panganiban articulated against the University of Santo Tomas. The first is the religious orthodoxy of the Dominicans, which for him impeded academic freedom. Second, the system of filling professorial chairs done without competitive examinations. Third, the faculty who teach multiple courses at once in an hour's worth of lecture. Fourth, the scholastic Aristotelian pedagogical paradigm which the Faculty of Medicine adopted. And lastly, the lack of a university-owned hospital and laboratories for clinical practice. Although Panganiban may have assessed Santo Tomas against the backdrop of the anti-clerical and liberal ethos and through the categories of secular royal universities in Spain, which had a secular faculty appointed by virtue of examinations, a more scientific paradigm, and the far more advanced facilities, I illustrated that his criticisms of the university find empirical grounding in his years of study at Santo Tomas. This then places Schumacher's argument and criticism in question, as these columns, although born out of propaganda, reflect the state of the university in the late 19th century. Finally, I located Panganiban's columns in the propaganda movement particularly in the liberal campaign for reforms in higher education. I argued that the campaign for reforms did not begin and end with Panganiban and his La Universidad de Manila. These, as I have shown, constituted a wider campaign for reforms in Philippine higher education in Spain, owing its origins to the political scene in Madrid in mid-1888 through Moraita's Asociación Hispano-Filipina to whom Lopez Jaina and the rest of La Solidaridad, including Panganiban, pledged their support in 1889. Panganiban and La Solidaridad also gained the support of Spanish liberals, Becerra, for example, whose brief term as Minister of Overseas Colonies was seen by many as a constant threat to the church in the Philippines. Between 1889 and 90, as I mentioned, he forwarded a series of policies but to no avail. Shortly after Sagasta's government fell in July 1890, Panganiban's death interrupted La Solidaridad's campaign for reforms at Santo Tomas. At Boraita's behest, Del Pilar tried resuming the publication, uh, albeit intermittently, of the La Universidad de Manila columns in La Solidaridad, beginning in December 15, 1890. Written by Del Pilar, Ponce, and Duna, these columns elaborated the points Panganiban raised in the 1889 columns and called for Santo Tomas to align its program of study with those enforced in the universities in Spain, given the latter's royal character. Finally, as La Solidaridad brought their campaign to the Madrilenian public, a more compromising becerra to the parliament uh, sorry, lobby to the parliament a bill reorganizing public education in the Philippines. But in a conservative-laden government, 
the vacillating governments brought about by the Turno Pacifico, the strong position of the Catholic Church, his proposal unfortunately did not go any further. The campaign for reform in higher education died in its early stages, so Ponce said, while the University of Santo Tomas remained hitherto in the hands of the Dominicans. Thank you very much. Dios mabalos po. Thank you so much, Sir Jai. So, uh, by the way, I want to introduce myself. My name is Joanne Piconcilio from Moseo Nijese Robredo. We will now accept questions for our speakers. Feel free to ask questions on our comment section at our Facebook Live. So before that, habang nagtatay po kayo ng question, I just want to extend um, our gratitude sa mga sumusunod na Moseo ng National Historical Commission of the Philippines. Moseo ni Jose Rizal sa Dapitan. Thank you so much, Ms. Uh, Sophie, Moseyo ni Juan at Antonio Luna, Moseyo ng kasaysayang Boholanom, uh, Ma'am Perli, uh, Ma Perlina, Moseyo ng kasaysayang pang-ekonomiya ng Pilipinas, Miss Jessel, maraming salamat po. And then the rest of the team ng Laylayan, maraming salamat sa pagsuporta. So sa may mga katanungan, please uh, message or put your question in the comment section. So ito pong uh, first question to Mr. Jai is uh, derived from the question ng aming, aming um, online um, discussion or I mean online na nakuhang mga questions sa kanilang pag uh, entry ng kanilang entry form dito sa online ng ating webinar. So first question, sir, is what are the other tangible achievement that Pangadniban contributed to the propaganda movement in Madrid? Thank you very much for that question. Uh, for starters, Pangadniban did not write much, unlike Del Pilar and Rizal. Kokonti lang yung talagang nasulat ni Pangadniban. Ano. And I consider La Universidad de Manila as his major contribution. This was his major uh writing in the pages of La Solidaridad. But he also wrote an article titled, uh, I think the title was uh, Pensamientos. That was his very first article. And I believe it was his thoughts on the use of reason, scientific uh, reason or reasoning. So he was talking about the enlightenment. He was talking about the freedom of the press, which I think can be very timely uh, right now with everything that's going on. Uh, yung pensamientos nandun, doon niya, niya talaga uh, inargue na kailangan natin ng press, ng free press to, as, to act as a check and balance with the state or the government. The other one was, I believe, the uh, article titled Los Nuevos Ayuntamiento uh, or Ayuntamientos in the Philippines. So I, I think he was talking about the, the three ayuntamientos that were uh, established during that time. And at the same time, he was criticizing how uh, the, the government was not, uh, was not, uh, do you call this, implementing these policies that uh, were coming from the liberal government in Spain. Kasi kung minsan hindi sinusunod ng Governor General yung, uh, yung mga nanggagaling na mandate from the Prime Minister or from Manuel Becerra. So Panganiban was criticizing, I think uh, Valeriano Weiler was the, was the Governor General during that time. Please just correct me if I'm wrong, baka mali yung naalala ko. Uh, Panganiban was critical of that Governor General for not implementing the policies that were being uh, passed on to him by uh, Manuel Becerra. And then uh, two years after Panganiban died, I think uh, La Solidaridad published posthumously uh, two short stories titled uh, Kandeng and Clarita Perez. So kung may kopya po kayo ng La Solidaridad, uh, pwedeng pwede niyo po hanapin doon. You know, I think March and May 1892, uh, inilabas posthumously yung dalawang unedited uh, manuscript daw 
sabi ni Del Pilar, ng stories na sinulat ni Panganiban. So, ang theme ng stories na yon was it was actually highly anti-clerical. So, kung mababasa niyo sana yon mas maganda, no? That could be a subject for another for another webinar kasi it's it's another topic altogether. Thank you for that, sir. So, at least um Panganiban have very I have a tangible achievements when he was in propaganda. So another question, sir, is based on academic record in UST, who is better student, Rizal or Jomapa? That is another question that derived from our um, comment section. I knew that question was coming. I was anticipating that question this morning. Uh, short answer, Panganiban. Panganiban was better uh, than Rizal because uh, Rizal was more into the liberal arts than he was in the natural sciences. Whereas Panganiban uh, was less of a writer than Rizal, but he was more of a medical student. He excelled in practically all courses at UST, uh, except for the first year medicine proper courses. I think all his courses were sobresaliente, except for the first year uh, medical proper courses. But even those courses, yung sa first year niya, uh, matataas pa rin yung grades niya, kahit uh, lower than sobresaliente. Rizal, on the other hand, had uh, several bueno or good. He had several uh, fair, I think, if I'm not mistaken. So, mas matataas yung grades ni Panghaniban sa USD than Jose Rizal. Okay, thank you for that, sir, um, answering my question. So another, uh, in brief, uh, this is my personal question, sir. I all also visit the Museum of um, Minor Seminary. So based from that, there, meron silang record doon na nakalagay yung grade ni uh, Joe Mapa. Can you tell um, maybe a short um, story about his progress in um, minor seminary when he was in that school book? I'm, about the about his achievement or grade so based on the record parang so so resilient rin yung mga grade niya as i um see the ano po the the artifacts na nasa museum itself unfortunately i haven't visited the mm. seminary pero doon sa archives sa USD mm -hmm. i was able to find panganiban's grades and it showed Straight sobre saliente from his first year until his last year at seminary. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, sir. So uh, at least we are familiar how Jomapa as a student, so parang nakaka-inspire nakaka para sa mga nanunod ng mga studyante dyan. Okay, and another question, sir. Um, if Jomapa did not die at the age of 27, what do you think is his further contribution on the Philippines during that time? Ako, my answer to that question will be what we call a counterfactual. Yung what if. No? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not so sure. But definitely he would have continued his uh, writings on the Philippine higher education. I think he would have concentrated on that because the other propagandists would look to him or look at him as the authority on that subject. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So talagang napaka, uh, napaka usong tanong yan in every situation in history, that what if question. So that's our favorite always. So another question, sir, from our um, Mr. John Paul Igalian Abilera. What did the other educational institution during that time react to Panganiban writings and thoughts? That's a very good question, but unfortunately, I have yet to look at that. You know, it will be very interesting how the Jesuits of the Ateneo Municipal de Manila uh, supported UST during uh, during that time when they were undergoing uh, that siege from the propagandists who were actually their students. Uh, it would be very interesting to see whether the Jesuits were very vocal in supporting the, uh, the Dominicans no, when they were under siege. Uh, 
As to Mr. Abilera's question, I can answer that in the context of the 1870-71 secularization of UST. The other educational institutions uh, wrote their statements of uh, support to the Dominican fathers of UST. So the Jesuits of Ateneo, they were very vocal that uh, Moret's decree was illegal, was unconstitutional, it was not right that they strip off the Dominicans of, uh, of their right to administer UST, among other educational institutions that they manage in the Philippines like Letran. So uh, in the context of Moret and his decree of 1870-71, uh, the Jesuits were very much supportive of the Dominicans, even though these two religious orders had their conflicts in the past. So kahit nagkakaloon ng uh, tunggalian, or ng banggaan itong dalawang religious orders, uh, the Jesuits supported the Dominicans nevertheless. But in the context of Panganiban's writings and thoughts, I have yet to look into that. Uh, I believe the answer to your question, Mr. Abilera, may be found in, in the Jesuit archives in Ateneo. But unfortunately, we won't be able to visit that uh, until the restrictions are... are uh, you know, have been removed yung, yung ating community quarantine. So, siguro kapag naka-access tayo sa Jesuit archives, baka mabigyan tayo ng konting insight as to how the Jesuits, the Ateneo, uh, reacted to Panganiban's writings and thoughts. Okay, thank you, sir, for that, um, answering that certain question. I hope na uh, matindihan ni Sir John Paul ang, 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 ang about kay Mr. Ay, kay Joe Mapa. So another question po is from Mr. Chris De Jesus. What is your reaction to La Universidad de Manila of Joe Mapa and the essay written by Rizal on the town school in the Philippines? Were, were there similarities or differences? Mm -hmm. Uh, first, I'd like to ask Mr. De Jesus, which is this essay? Uh, where can we find this essay, Town Schools in the Philippines? Unless we can identify precisely, is it an article in La Solidaridad? Uh, then maybe I can address the question. But uh, on the other hand, I think Rizal was concentrating more on uh, primary education in his writings. Uh, I'm not so sure if you wrote about secondary education. On the other hand, Panganiban was focusing on uh, what we call superior enseñanza or higher education. So ito yung medicine, uh, civil law, theology, even the sciences and pharmacy. So yun yung kasama doon sa mga uh, sinulat ni Panganiban. Itong Kirizal, uh, Mr. De Jesus, could you please give us the exact uh, provenance of this, this essay? Saan ba ito nang galing? saan natin siya makikita para masagot natin ng maayos yung tanong. Thank you. Okay, so we will get back to you, Mr. De Jesus, about that question. I, I can send the email of Mr. Jai to you para mas masagot uh, yung, yung katanungan at matbigay mo rin yung intamang information kay Sir Jay para magkaroon ng mas magandang uh, comparison yung inyong katanungan. Okay, for the last Siguro last question is, this is a very, uh, where is the first monument of Jomapa and why is it uh, uh, erected on that certain area? Po? Yeah. So there's a question from that. Uh, why? <laughs> Honestly, as a history major, yung mga professors namin, they were not fond of firsts. You know, kasi it will be very, very difficult to prove uh, you will have the burden of proof you know, kapag inargue mo na ito yung first. Pero marami nagsasabi na yung unang monumento daw ni Panganiban. And I think uh, it's, been, it's already been written uh, as a resolution here in Naga ay yung matatagpuan sa Naga Central School 1. And uh, I believe seven years ago, yung sa Central 1, ano? so seven years ago, itong si uh, counselor, then counselor Nathan Serio was the one who discovered na it was in fact Panganiban, it was not Rizal, but Panganiban. So since then, uh, then Councillor Serio, he lobbied to the NHCP that this monument be preserved, be funded, be taken care of by the government, you know, and that every 
uh, every year that all occasions on Panganiban will be held uh, at Naga Central School 1. So may resolution ng pinasa niya ng Naga City na yun yung naging uh, official monument ni Panganiban. Which is quite, uh, I find it, ano ba? Uh, which is quite ironic because he's not from Naga. He's from Mambulao, from uh, Camarines Norte. But the official monument of Panganiban is here in Naga. So uh, he was quite displaced in that regard. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Joanne, I think pinagawa yun ng parent-teacher association ng Naga Central School 1. Uh, some secondary sources would say in the 1930s. You know? And then may nakasulat daw doon sa monument na yun, uh, encouraging students to emulate Panganiban, to be like Panganiban, to be industrious and studious like Panganiban, etc. So uh, I'd like to, to argue that it's actually a case of appropriation again, you know? The, the, the Nagenyos appropriating Panganiban, for example, even though Panganiban is not originally from Naga. So uh, I'd like to think that's one of the first monuments, but I'm not so sure. And I wouldn't go as far as arguing that that's the very first. Malay natin, may nauna pa, di lang natin alam. Um, I was also able to go to Daet uh, a couple of years ago. One time, I, I asked my father na papunta kami ng Maynila. Sabi ko, trip lang. Doon tayo dumaan sa kabila, sa Camarines Norte. So dumaan kami doon sa, sa capital ng Daet. And we found a monument there of Panganiban. And closed in a, I'm not sure if it was glass or plastic case. So hindi siya nakadisplay sa isang plaza, pero nasa loob siya ng Kapitolyo. Nakadisplay siya sa isang case. I don't know why it's it's like that. Bakit din la din display sa labas? Um, but it's the other Panganiban monument that I was able to uh, visit. I'm not sure kung meron sa town ng Jose Panganiban because I haven't had the chance to uh, to visit the town. Pero meron yata ng ininstall do ng NHCP ano? Hindi yon nagkakabale. <laughs> Thank you, John. Okay, so thank you for that, sir. Talaga tama po yung sinabi mo, sir. It was Um, initiated by the Parents Association or Parents and Teacher Association dahil uh, we attend this morning the inauguration po ng uh, ni Jomapa sa Naga Central 1. So, uh, pahabol po si Chris De Jesus po si Miss, uh, ang sabi niya po is la, in, la instruction po ni Rizal. Instruction. Was that an essay, a standalone essay or nasa la solidaridad siya? <laughs> so ito yung mga kailangan natin i-clarify mo. Okay, so we will just uh, give a, another answer to Mr. I will just give you, sir, the um, um, name and messenger of Mr. Chris De Jesus. And another last question for this webinar is uh, ako, uh, a question from Mr. Don Francis. Was being a Catholic the problem of UST as an educational institution during the term of 19th century or was it their anti-liberal stance? I'm very happy my parish priest is actually watching this morning. Hi, Father Francis. <laughs> Kasama ko pa lang siya the other day sa St. Jude. Um, the answer to Father Francis's question is not necessarily, it's not the Catholic character of UST that was, uh, you know, turning the students off and uh, prompting them to leave the university. But I think it was, this, uh, it was this need to secularize that these students saw that the university did not address. Kasi in the, in the late 19th century, uh, kailangan na ng mga skwelahan na maging secularized na. Eh. May mga sciences na na kailangan na matutunan. May mga civil law courses na na hindi naman kailangan friars yung nagtuturo. No? So in other words, um, education had to be decentralized uh, from the monopoly of the Catholic Church and also entrusted into the hands of uh, secular professors like you have medical doctors, you have the, the uh, licensed uh, lawyers. So parang yung gusto mangyari ng mga estudyante nun ay let the secular professors teach the secular faculties na alisin na natin yung mga Uh, friars, dahil hindi naman necessarily sila yung best na magturo ng medical courses, for example. 
um, we have medical doctors. Right? UST was able to train uh, doctors already by the time of Panganiban. Konti pa rin, pero at least meron. Diba? Merong mga doctors na pwede na magturo. Uh, siguro, yun yung masasagot ko kay Father Francis. It's not necessarily that Catholic character of the university that was the issue to students. But, but it was more of the, the failure or the uh, inability to address the secular needs of the university. Kailangan may mga professors din tayo na specialized doon sa medicine, halimbawa, sa pharmacy, at sa civil law. So yun. Thank you, Father Francis. <laughs> okay, thank you, sir. Thank you for that question, sir. Uh, uh, sa sa yung dating parish priest, sa parish priest. And thank you, sir, Jai, for answering question. Uh, that would be our last question. So for those who are listening and watching our webinar, if you have any question, don't hesitate to message us in our Facebook page or in our comment section. We will answer that question. Uh, we will give it to Mr. Jai and then it will send directly into your messenger ang, ang yung mga sagot sa inyong mga katanungan. So thank you so much, sir. And I just want to remind our viewers that please answer the evaluation form. So you will receive a e-certificate that will be sent in your email. So therefore, so this would be our conclusion for our webinar for this morning. I hope that we learned a lot uh, through this webinar. We would like to remind uh, yes, our participant to answer the evaluation form at the comment section, uh, our Facebook Live to receive the digital certificate of participation. Before we conclude our program today, we would like to thank some people who made this lecture possible. First, we thank our speaker, Mr. Javier, Leonardo, uh, Mr. Javier uh, for the uh, time and knowledge who uh, he shared with us today. We would also like to thank the National Historical Commission of the Philippines led by Executive Director Restituto L. Aguilar and Dr. Rene R. Escalante, our Chief at Historic um, Site Education uh, Division, Ms. Gina Batuhan, our Supervisor, uh, HSDO, Mr. Brian Anthony Paraiso, our colleagues in the Ilocos Visayas Mindanao Museum Cluster for their assistance and our curator, um, Mr. Mark Anthony Rabusa and Mr. Um, Janelle Rabusa of Museo El Deposite for assisting in our webinar for this morning. Thank you, sir. Maraming salamat po. And, and, and finally, to our attendees for this morning, mara, uh, maraming salamat po. Please, uh, I just want to uh, give you, I just want to invite you, my uh, viewers, to please check the Facebook page of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines and its 27 Museum for more activities. So please always um, watch our, or see our Facebook page, especially Museo ni Jesse Robredo, for more activities and webinars and workshops that we are conducting this year and for the month of February. Again, just mabalus po sa keep safe and have a good day.